Hello, welcome. Thank you for joining us. And those of you who are here in person, um, as well as those who are joining us digitally, very happy to have you with us this afternoon. My name is Dan Sheely, and on behalf of the University of Pennsylvania's Program for Research on Religion and Urban Civil Society, which we call Prox, um, as well as on behalf of the Collegium Institute, I'd like to thank you for joining us for this Perry Collegium Initiative event titled The Ethics of Killing, Anscombe's Contribution to Understanding Murder. If anyone would like to receive announcements about other Perry Collegium Initiative special events, please do add yourself to a sign-up list that may or may not be circulating, or just grab one of us after this if you're not already on it. As you may know, today's event is part of a robust programming initiative made possible by a partnership among the University of Pennsylvania Libraries, the University's Department of Philosophy, and the University's Program for Research on Religion and Urban Civil Society, which is centered upon the deposit of the Collegium Institute Anscombe Archive at Penn. GEM Anscombe, or Elizabeth Anscombe, is widely known as one of the most influential moral philosophers in the Anglo analytic tradition of the 20th century, who helped transform moral philosophy in wartime Oxford, as we heard from some of our previous Anscombe lecturers, including Jennifer Frey, Benjamin Lipscomb, Candace Vogler, Clara McCool, and Rachel Wiseman. While she spent most of her career in England, Anscombe was also a longtime visiting professor of philosophy at the University of Pennsylvania, which helps explain how we were able to have her papers transferred here in 2018. The Collegium Institute Anscombe Archive at the University of Pennsylvania consists of over 600 cataloged items, including unpublished manuscripts in various stages of revision, philosophical off-prints with substantial marginalia, personal correspondence with major philosophical figures, including, of course, her mentor, Ludwig Wittgenstein. Uh, more on that later, um, but we'll have a conference devoted to their relationship next month. Um, and other kinds of journals, including journals, uh, uh, pen, pen notebooks. These are contained in 21 archival boxes. This partnership has become a nexus for new academic networks and learning opportunities on campus, including annual conferences and workshops based on Anscombe's work, other special events and seminars, and the appointment of undergraduate, graduate, and faculty fellowships. The Collegium Institute the Philosophy Department at Prox also has sponsored short visiting research fellowships, wherein distinguished scholars and develop their philosophical projects in relation to the archive. And it's my privilege to introduce a former holder of one of these fellowships now. Dr. Joshua Stucklick is professor of philosophy at the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota. During the current academic year, he is a fellow at the Stockdale Center for Ethical Leadership at the Naval Academy. He also serves as assistant editor for the American Catholic Philosophical Quarterly. Dr. Stuckley received a doctorate from the University of Pittsburgh, which of course a global stronghold of analytic philosophy, but also of Anscombian philosophy in particular. He was since awarded a fellowship at the Institute for Advanced Study at the University of Notre Dame in 2019-2020, where he completed his monograph Intention and Wrongdoing in Defense of Double Effect that Cambridge University Press published the following year, in 2021. In this important book, Professor Stuckley challenges philosophical orthodoxies on double effect, responds to objections, and situates the principle within a moral framework of human solidarity. Now, the book was amazing, um, but I'm also told today uh, that had Professor Stuckley studied the Anscombe Archive before his publication, there are certain things uh, that he would have changed in the book. 
And we're fortunate I think, to hear today about uh, some such things and other fruits of his studies in the Anscombe archive. So please join me in welcoming Professor Josh to the study. Thank you for all being here today. Uh, thanks to Dan and Fujim Institute and Frost for having me here today. Uh, this uh, lecture I'm gonna give today is based on a longer paper I've been working on, on um, Anscombe's concept of murder, which in which I'm trying to synthesize um, Anscombe's published writings on the topic with um, unpublished documents in the Anscombe archive. The topic of murder was among Elizabeth Anscombe's central preoccupations. She garnered international attention in 1956 for protesting Oxford's decision to award an honorary degree to former US President Harry Truman. And the ground of her opposition was that in authorizing the use of atomic weapons at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Truman had authorized the mass murder of Japanese civilians. After receiving a chair of philosophy at Cambridge, he taught seminars on the topic of killing human beings for four years in the early 1970s. Concern with the theme of murder is also evident in many of Anscombe's writings. Her indictment of British academic moral philosophy in her paper, Modern Moral Philosophy, is based on the preparedness of these philosophers to approve of murder and other intrinsically bad types of action. The prohibition on murder also appears in her essays on the ethics of war, euthanasia, double effect, and political philosophy. Finally, Anscombe's seminal work in action theory, Intention, investigates a topic that is integral to her account of murder. My plan today is to discuss Anscombe's contribution to understanding the concept of murder, integrating newly available material from the Anscombe archive housed here at the University of Pennsylvania with her published writings. The archival documents reveal that Anscombe was working toward a systematic theory of murder. As she puts it in one unpublished manuscript, quote, an inquiry into what constitutes murder and what should be our attitude towards it, end quote. I will begin by discussing the context of mid 20th century moral philosophy, which explains why she found her project pressing. I'll also explain why Anskin was concerned to deny the semantic thesis that murder simply means unjustified killing. And I'll lay out two challenges that an account of murder that rejects the semantic thesis must surmount. In the remainder of the talk, I'll then show how Anskin answers each of these challenges. So this is part one on the context for Anskin's investigation. The motivation for Anskin's investigation may be found in her attack on mid 20th century British moral philosophy. In modern moral philosophy, she proposes three theses. The third of which is that, quote, the differences between the well-known English writers on moral philosophy from Sidgwick to the present day, that is 1958, are of little importance, end quote. Now, there were certainly many differences between the philosophers whom Anscombe is targeting here. Sidgwick and Moore were consequentialists, while Pritchard and Ross were deontologists. And all these philosophers were metaethical realists, and hence disagreed with non cognitivists such as Ayer and Hare. However, in Anscombe's mind, the differences between these philosophers were all eclipsed by a position they held in common, namely the rejection of absolute moral prohibitions. In rejecting these, the well known English moral philosophers contradict the Hebrew Christian ethic, which holds that there are some types of action that are morally impossible, forbidden whatever consequences threaten. So now I'm looking at quotation one, which is on your handout from Modern Moral Philosophy, where Anscombe writes, the, the prohibition of certain things simply in virtue of their description as such and such identifiable kinds of action, regardless of any further consequences, certainly not the whole of the Hebrew Christian ethic, but it is a noteworthy feature of it. And if every academic philosopher since Sidgwick has written in such a way as to exclude this ethic, 
It would argue a certain provinciality of mind not to see this incompatibility as the most important fact about these philosophers and the differences between them somewhat trifling by comparison. End quote. Among the absolute prohibitions and characteristic of the Hebrew Christian ethic is the fifth commandment. And here I'm using the numbers from St. Augustine and certain other traditions that label this as the sixth commandment. The King James Bible translates the commandment as thou shalt not kill. But Anson claims, and I think she is justified in doing so, that a better translation is thou shalt do no murder. The commandment is meant to be action guided. One is supposed to be able to use it to reason to someone, perhaps even including oneself, that he ought to abstain from some contemplated act of killing on the ground that to do it would be to commit murder. In other words, the commandment is supposed to be apt for use in arguments of the following form. Premise one, this would be an action of such and such a kind. Premise two, an action of that kind is murder. Conclusion, therefore, to do this would be to commit murder. As Gansom says, this syllogism constitutes a powerful piece of practical reason. For the agent considering it may have a will not to be murderous. And if he does, he will be moved by it to abstain from the contemplated course of action. The fifth commandment stands in sharp contrast with the well-known English moral philosophers. These philosophers all reject what Anthony Paul's following Bertrand Russell, taboo morality, according to which one is not to commit an injustice against anyone to get any good or avoid any evil. There is one possible move, however, that if successful, would undermine the contrast that Anska wants to draw here. That is the claim that murder just means unjustified or impermissible killing. If this semantic thesis is correct, then there will be universal agreement that murder is always wrong, but only for the uninteresting reason that it is true as a matter of definition. Someone who thinks, for instance, that the atomic bombings were justified on consequentialist grounds would simply deny that the civilians killed in a Hiroshima were murdered. The semantic thesis therefore drains the fifth commandment of any substantive content, reducing it to the platitude, thou shalt not kill human beings in cases where thou shalt not. It also disrupts the pattern of practical reasoning I set out earlier. For if it's true, then it's not possible to reason with someone that he ought to abstain from some course of action on the ground that it would be murder. Against the semantic thesis, Anscombe believes that G. E. Moore was right in Principia Ethica to ask the question, is murder ever permissible? In raising this question, Moore showed he understood that the question of whether murder is always unjustified is a substantive question, not one that can be settled by conceptual analysis. Yet, if the question whether murder is always unjustified is substantive, then it's pressing to provide a philosophical account of what murder is. Moreover, such an account must overcome several challenges, each of which involves explaining how to accommodate certain facts that seem to suggest that impermissibility or unjustifiability is built into the concept of murder. I'm going to discuss two of these challenges today. The first is that the concept of culpability is built into the concept of murder. In her paper, The Two Kinds of Error in Action, Anska makes this point when she claims that formality is essential to murder. In this respect, murder may be contrasted with adultery. Suppose a man lives with a woman he has every reason to believe he has married, but in fact, she is already married to someone else, and so by the laws of his society, not to him. He has satisfied, it seems, the definition of adultery, which is sexual intercourse between a married person and someone who is not his or her spouse. Yet, it would be harsh to find him guilty committing the moral offense of adultery. 
According to Anscombe, the way to resolve any perplexity here is to say that while the man performed actions that were materially acts of adultery, he did not formally commit adultery. Although he did have sexual relations with a woman who is not his wife, his good faith ignorance means he is not culpable for doing so. And this is what is signaled by saying he did not formally commit adultery. If, however, a man pours a drink for his wife that he reasonably believes is gin, but in fact it's petrol and she dies, he has not committed an act of material murder. The proof that the man could not have reasonably known that the liquid was petrol is a proof that we are not dealing with an act of murder here at all, but rather a tragic accident. What this sort of case shows is that culpability is built into the concept of murder. But if culpability is built in, doesn't that show that wrongness or unjustifiability is as well? For it seems that any justification for doing something that causes a person's death will remove culpability and therefore show that the deed is not to be called murder after all. That's the first challenge. The second is raised by the observation that the verdict about whether to call killings murderous sometimes does require that we first determine whether there are any, whether they are justified by other ethical considerations, such as proportionality and necessity. Consider, for example, collateral damage to non-combatants that occurs when military targets are attacked in war. Many people believe that collateral killings are not always murder, but this does not mean that such killings are always ethically in the clear either. If the war is manifestly unjust, or the number of non-combatant deaths are grossly disproportionate to the value of the target, or the attack is unnecessary for achieving the aims of the war, then the non-combatants have been murdered. Therefore, in at least some cases, we do seem to decide first whether some killings are justified, and if they are not, if they are not justified, we judge them to be murderous. And the rest of the talk, I'm going to try to show how it is in response to both of these challenges. So this is the next section on murder and responsibility. Let us begin with the idea noted in the first challenge that formality is essential to murder. Anscom says that a modern way of putting this point is to say that responsibility is built into the concept. Responsibility is at the heart of Anscom's account of murder. For, quote, murder is killing which involves a special degree and kind of responsibility for death, end quote. The statement that murder involves a special degree and kind of responsibility for death implies that there are different kinds of responsibility. Anscombe distinguishes between three levels of responsibility, which she calls in one unpublished document, causality, accountability, and creditability. At the first level, to say that agent S is responsible for event E is to say that S is a cause or condition of E. And to say that S is not responsible is to say that he is not a cause or condition of E. Even inanimate objects can be responsible at this level. The wind may be responsible for the breaking of a vase, for example, and a stroke of lightning can be responsible for a wildfire. The second level of responsibility is accountability or callability to account. To call someone to account for some action or omission is to request or demand an explanation for it, one that is couched in terms of the agent's reasons for acting or not acting as she did. Since only a rational agent can give an account, a necessary condition for accountability for some action at time T is that the one being called to account is a rational agent able to exercise her rational capacities at time T. A rational agent is not accountable for just anything she does, but only for her voluntary actions and omissions and their effects. The third level of responsibility, creditability, comes into play when the agent is responsible at the second level for some effect that is good or evil. In the case of an evil, the agent will bear this sort of responsibility when, first of all, she is accountable for that evil, and second, 
he lacks an exonerating account for bringing it about. In that case, the agent is guilty of bringing about the evil and is appropriately blamed for it. When Anscombe says that murder is killing, which involves a special kind of responsibility for death, the kind of responsibility she has in mind is level three. A murderer causes the death of another human being. He is accountable for that death. He lacks an exonerating account. As she puts it, if you murder someone, then the evil of his death lies at your door and his blood is on your head. Moreover, since murder is a grave injustice, you have seriously wronged the victim and the evil of this injustice is also imputable to you. It follows that a philosophical account of murder will involve delineating the factors that can exonerate an agent from bearing guilt or level three responsibility for causing another's death. Anscombe notes that a variety of exonerating answers is possible. And now I turn to quotation two on your handout, which is a murder and the morality of euthanasia, where she writes, quote, one who is callable to account may not be guilty, even though he did cause death, because there is an exonerating answer. The range of such answers is very wide. He was sleepwalking. He stumbled. He did not know he was administering poison. He did not intend death, but something else which was quite legitimate. He was acting with legitimate authority. He had no duty to prevent death. We can classify the exonerating responses that Anscombe lists here into five types. First, the agent's responsibility for death is only level one responsibility. Answers such as, I was sleepwalking, or I stumbled, are of this type. Note, though, that strictly speaking, this is not an exonerating answer, for the need for exoneration presupposes an instance of voluntary agency for which the agent is accountable. But if the agent's responsibility is only level one, then there is no voluntary action for him to account for. Two, the agent was ignorant that he was doing something that would cause or risk of causing death, where the ignorance is not due to negligence. I didn't know I was administering poison is of this type. If I really had every reason to believe I was not, if I really had every reason to believe I was actually pouring a glass of gin. In this case, there is a voluntary action for which I can be called to account, right, pouring the drink. But my blameless ignorance that the, that the liquid was poisonous means that I was not voluntarily poisoning or killing the victim, though I am level one responsible for her death. Third, the agent did not intentionally kill the victim, but the death was a perceived side effect of some course of action. As we shall see in a moment, Anscombe argues that this sort of response can sometimes exonerate the agent from guilt for causing death. Fourth, the agent intentionally killed the victim, but the agent was exercising legitimate authority in killing her. This sort of response involves what Anson calls a title to kill, which I will not be able to discuss today, although it's relevant for cases such as capital punishment and killing in war. Fifth, the victim's death could have been prevented if the agent had fought, but the agent had no duty to fight. The ability of this type of answer to exonerate depends on the way we attribute omissions and their effects. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to pass over this as well. It's crucial to note one possible justification for causing death that does not appear on our list of exonerating responses, namely a justification that refers to the advantages to be gained or disadvantages to be avoided by intentionally killing an innocent person. Modern moral philosophers frequently devise scenarios in which an agent can kill one or more people as a means to saving a greater number. So anyone who's taken a course in contemporary ethics will be introduced to a whole cast of hypothetical characters who do things like shoot hostages, hang scapegoats, and cut up people to steal their organs for consequentialist reasons. If this is admitted as a justification, then Anscom insists it is not a justification that exonerates from the guilt of having committed murder. Rather, it would be a justification for murder. 
Why that should be the case is an important question. And I'll return to it in just a moment. At this juncture, though, I want to show that this kind of enables the answer to reply to the first challenge I raised above. Recall that she denies that unjustifiability or impermissibility are part of the concept of murder. The question whether murder is ever justified is a substantive one. However, she also asserts that culpability is built into the concept, which is now understood as level three responsibility or guilt. The problem was that if guilt is built into the concept of murder, then it appears that unjustifiability must be as well. Anskin's response is to deny the premise that any alleged justification for doing something that causes someone's death will remove the guilt of committing murder. If Alfred kills innocent Betty in order to save five others from being killed, then Alfred has murdered Betty. If a philosopher thinks that Alfred's killing of Betty is justified, then what he thinks is justified is Alfred's incurring the guilt of murder. I noted above that murder is an injustice that wrongs its victim. I think that Anskin would also reject the claim that this implies that murder is unjustified as a matter of definition. He no doubt would argue that it is also a substantive question whether a person can ever be justified in wronging others. That seems right. Jeff McMahon, for example, claims that an agent can sometimes act with objective moral justification and yet inflict harm on an innocent person that wrongs its victim. McMahon thinks this can occur, for, exa for example, when an innocent person's rights are overridden by sufficiently strong consequentialist considerations. Even if McMahon's claim is false, as Anselm would say it's false, it does not seem to be conceptually incoherent. The disagreement between McMahon and a proponent of taboo morality, like Anselm, who holds that we ought never to commit an injustice against anyone is a substantive decision. Okay, moving on to the third and final section on the significance of intention. I said earlier that according to Anscombe, the distinction between intentional killing and incidental killing, or killing in which death is a foreseen side effect of the agent's conduct, is significant in the following way. The fact that an agent caused someone's death incidentally can sometimes exonerate from the guilt of murder, whereas intentionally killing an innocent person as a means to bring about good outcomes or avoiding evil ones cannot. Anska makes this point in Mr. Truman's degree and adds that killing the innocent as an end in itself always, also always constitutes murder. And this is the third quotation now on her handout, where she writes, quote, choosing to kill the innocent as a means to your ends is always murder. Naturally, killing the innocent as an end in itself is murder too. I intend my formulation to be taken strictly. Each term in it is necessary. For killing the innocent, even if you know as a matter of statistical certainty that the things you do involve it is not necessarily murder. I mean that if you attack a lot of military targets, such as munitions factories and naval dockyards, as carefully as you can, you will be certain to kill a number of innocent people, but that is not murder. On the other hand, unscrupulousness in considering the possibilities turns it into murder." End quote. The claim that the distinction between intentional and incidental harm has ethical significance is characteristic of the principle of double effect. In two of her published essays, Anscombe proposes a version of the principle, which she calls the principle of side effects, or PSE for short. And I have this at the bottom of your handout. PSE, the prohibition on murder does not cover all bringing about of deaths which are not intended. Notice that the PSE presupposes the Decalogue's prohibition of murder and the claim that intentionally killing innocent people always constitutes murder. But while you must not aim at the death of an innocent person, quote, causing it does not necessarily incur guilt, end quote. The principle is modest in two respects. First, it does not cover the bringing about of bad effects in general. 
It is specifically about death. And the question of when causing death constitutes murder. Second, it does not attempt to state necessary and sufficient conditions for the permissibility of causing incidental death. It simply says that incidental killings are not always murder. Why accept the claim that the intentional killing of the innocent is always murder? Anscombe's answer is that this is central to our common understanding of what murder is. Now I'm reading publication four on your handout, which is from an unpublished document in the Anscombe archive. There, Anscombe writes, quote, the central concept of murder is that of intentional killing of the innocent. This gives us our sharpest and most full-blown picture of the murderer par excellence. He is willing to kill those who have done him no wrong. His hand is ready to shed innocent blood. Everywhere were such actions on the part of murderous rulers, soldiers, terrorists, or other armed men are reported, these phrases occur. Killing innocent people, compassing the death of innocent bystanders, slaughtering the crowd of innocent and helpless victims, and so on, end quote. The intentional killing of the innocent thus constitutes the hard core of murder. Hardcore cases involve the central meaning of malice as it occurs in the understanding of murder as killing with malice authority. Here, malice does not note a spiteful feeling, but rather the badness of the agent's intention. The hardcore of murder forms a relatively well-defined area. The main place there is apt to be controversy is the question of who counts as innocent in times of war. On Anston's view, the innocent is anyone who is not nocentes, as the Latin would suggest. And people are nocentes when they are engaged in an objectively unjust proceeding, such as an unjust attack. The principle of side effects states that the prohibition on murder does not cover all bringing about of deaths which are not intended. The rationale for this is that there are both cases in which killing is not intended, and yet clearly are cases of murder, and also cases in which killing is not intended and clearly are not cases of murder. Examples of the former include a situation where a man burns down a house, not with the intention of killing anyone inside, perhaps he just wants to collect the insurance, but without caring whether, whether there is anyone there and someone is killed. In the case of Euphorpro's father, played as Euphorpro, who neglected to feed and shelter a field laborer tied up in his custody, and who watched with indifference as the man died of exposure. Cases of incidental killings such as these form a penumbra that surrounds the hardcore of murder. In them, the agent displays a callous disregard for human life that is equally, or perhaps even more heinous, in some cases of intentional killing. Since murder is distinguished from lesser forms of culpable homicide on the basis of its heinousness, Anscom thinks it would be unreasonable not to regard these as cases of murder as well. On the other hand, though, there are also cases in which the agent brings about death incidentally, which are not cases of murder. A scenario that appears in many of Anscom's unpublished writings is a variation of the Smith case. This was a famous English murder trial in the mid-1960s. Smith was a petty thief who had stolen property from his car. When he was stopped for questioning, he sped off and the police officer jumped on the car. Smith drove a zigzag horse and the officer fell into oncoming traffic and died. However, we can change the details of the case so that Smith is actually a hero who is driving out of town with a bomb that is about to go off. There's no time to explain what's happening. So he speeds away from a traffic stop. And as before, a police officer jumps onto his car. Since the officer is obscuring to this view, he drives the zigzag course to shake him off, foreseeing that there is a risk the officer will be killed by the incoming traffic. And the risk is realized. When the facts of the case become known, in some claims, no one would bring a charge of murder against the hero Smith. He is accountable for bringing about the death of the police officer. 
but he possesses a legitimate exonerating response. In between these clear cases, there's a gray zone, which consists of borderline cases. The penumbra, as she puts it, is fuzzy, and its edges are blurred. These cases will often be disputable, and their classification will depend on things such as assessments of risk and the balancing of the goods and evils involved. The resolution, the resolution of such cases belongs to casuistry. And while casuistry, quote, may allow you to stretch a point on the circumference, it will not permit you to destroy the center, end quote. That quote is from modern moral philosophy. In the case of murder, the center is the hard core, which consists of the intentional killing of the innocent. To summarize, on Anscombe's account, the hard core of murder consists in the intentional killing of the innocent. This core is surrounded by a number, which includes some, but not all cases, in which death is not intended. When killing is incidental, the question of whether it belongs in the penumbra will be a matter of whether the agent possesses an exonerating response. And a common type of exonerating response will refer to the necessity of the agent's conduct for securing some great good or avoiding, or avoiding some great misfortune, as in the case of Hero Smith. However, this sort of exoneration is not available when the killing is in the hard war. These killings always constitute murder. Finally, we also have a response to our second challenge. That challenge observed that there are cases in which we first need to decide whether killings are justified by factors such as proportionality and necessity before determining whether they constitute murder. Anson's response is that while the observation is true for cases in which killing is not intentional, it does not follow that the business of calling something murder always waits upon the question of whether it is justified. In particular, it does not do so when the question, when what is in question is intentionally killing innocent human beings. This, of course, is just the nub of Anson's critique of Truman. Truman authorized the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which intentionally killed thousands of Japanese civilians as a means to ending the Second World War. These civilians, at least very many of them, were not engaged in the unjust war being fought by their government and armed forces, and so were innocent. Truman therefore authorized mass murder. And if we accept the authority of the Decalogue, we will hold that murder is always prohibited. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Sussberg. Um, it's okay. I invite you to this. I, I, I feel like that. I want you to do the spotlight, not that safe. <laughs> but yeah, the idea would be more comfortable. I'm a founder of the living room. I'm going to do this. I'm standing in the corner. And so, uh, generously offer to you to take questions, uh, any of us that can. Um, and, and maybe everyone here is got a hand already, um, but just in case not. Uh, oh, you did. Okay. I was going to say, I want to know if some of you have a question. First, um, the, the gentleman that asked the question, and then I have the other question. Uh, so, uh, my name is Jesse Anderson from the PhD Council uh, and philosophy here at that. Uh, and I'm uh, super interested in uh, talk. Um, so, uh, I'm going to run up a little bit and talk in. Uh, Could you speak up a little bit? Oh, yeah, sure. So, uh, so uh, my name is Jesse Anderson. I'm a PhD candidate uh, in the last few years. I'm also a uh, war veteran. Um, in place uh, called uh, Illusion. Um, and so I understand what, or I get the sense of what Anson is doing, um, where he's idealizing, he's making a, a few different idealizations. Um, and the one that I was hoping you could talk to is it seems like she is talking about killing as a process where one agent is in control. Um, and I wonder if her account of murder extends to 
more complex cases where it's not one agent, but the agent is a collective. So there's a squad um, or you know, an platoon or something even way more complex where um, there are multiple people um, that are working uh, across you know different you know temporal and spatial dimensions like when you fall in uh, you know an airstrike or another type of stories. Yeah, that's a, that's a really great question, right? I mean, anytime you have like wars, organized killing, and by playing um, in, in a collective context, and it's oftentimes going to be hard to um, like divide up the responsibility, right, and for for each individual micro action in that. Um, I don't know anywhere where Hanscom talks about collective agency. I think it's a really interesting question, though, because it does seem to me that. There can be cases where, um, right, two people are killing someone else together, and it doesn't have to be that each of the individual is as an individual, like literally killing, right? So you have a case where, oh, one person like holds the other, holds the victim down, and the other person is the one that plunges the knife in. Um, it's only that agent plunge a knife in that you know literally possibly killed the man, and yet. I think it's also right to say that and since they both killed him together, um, certainly if there was like a, a murder trial, right, they would both be accountable for murder. Um, and then the question is really going to be, you know, what, what conditions then does it take for someone to be engaging in a joint action of that sort or a collective action? Um, I think that's really interesting. I, I don't know anywhere where it can address this precisely that question about. So it's an interesting question in light of the fact that you're, you are or you're going to be a Stockdale doctor. I'm, I'm, I'm Stockdale fellow right, right now, yeah. Right now, okay. Uh, so who murdered at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, according to Anson? Did, was it the people who flew the plane and dropped the bomb, or was it Harry Truman? Well, I mean, her, her beef with Truman was that he had authorized yeah. the bombing. And he authorized it on the basis of certain knowledge. I mean, this is the problem with Anscombe's interpretation. Again, and for somebody who has a philosophy that begins with the description of the fact, she bases her argument uh, against Truman on what she thought was the case, that Stalin brought information to Potsdam that Japan wanted to surrender. But other information says no. The information that Stalin brought to Potsdam was that the Japanese wanted Russia to come in on the side of Japan and finally mount against the US and Britain. And so her premise for the her condemnation of Truman is based on some information which may or may not be true historically. Something that's just been interesting. Well, I, yeah, I mean, the, the best account I know of, of the atomic bombing was made by a man. I don't remember his, his first name, but his last name is Frank. It's called Downfall. And there, I think he shows the historical record doesn't support certain claims that Hanska makes in Mr. Truman's degree, in particular that the um, Japanese were, were, were wanting to surrender. And it was surrender only um, we would guarantee the retention of the emperor. Um, it, it appears they weren't really willing to surrender. Um, they they had a strategy called Katsugo, um, which means decisive battle. And the idea was they knew that the that the U.S. was going to have to invade Kyushu, which is the southern island of Japan. Um, they figured that out. They were, they were kind of mounting everything there, and their strategy. They knew they had lost the war, but they were going to try to inflict so much damage on the American invaders that people back home, right, in the United States would say, this is too much, right, this is too much bloodshed, we need to sue for, like, more favorable peace terms than the ones at, than the ones at Potsdam. Um, and in fact, even after they bombed Hiroshima, the um, people in charge of the Japanese government still weren't willing to, to surrender, right? So the, the second bomb, then the Soviets declared in war that same day, um, and then the emperor had to step in, um, and there was almost a coup against the emperor by some of the people in power. Um, so Anscom does claim in Mr. Truman's degree that the Japanese were sort of on the verge of surrendering. I think now we know that that's probably not the case. However, I, I still don't think that changes 
her argument that the atomic bombings constitute intentional killing of innocent people. Well, yeah, but if that's the only outcome that will bring you the end of the horrendous killing, and maybe you have to have a different interpretation of what the principle of sanctity of human life, what's the basic principle? I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah. Ask, ask him says in the yeah. debate, come on, are you really going to strike an attitude and say you shall not do evil that good may come? Yeah. And she imagines a case where someone's like, here, you know, boil the baby in water if it saves a thousand people or a hundred thousand or a million people, right? Whatever you want. Um, are you really going to strike the attitude and say you shall not do evil that good may come? And she's just like, you know, yes. I mean, there are some things in what she calls the Hebrew Christian tradition, yeah. which are absolute, which may, which may wow. never be done. Yeah, um, many many people right uh, in her day didn't think that was right. Many people today, certainly everyone I know today, at writes in just war theory. I don't know of any absolutists, right? Uh, the closest you get is Michael Walter, but even he thinks there's a supreme emergency objection. He thinks it's interesting enough that did not. Yeah. He thinks did not apply to Hiroshima. Yeah. He thinks it yeah. did apply to the um, early stages of the British bombing of the of the Germans in World War II. Um, but I think he's going to thinks if you're serious about the Decalogue, right? There are there aren't any Supreme Emergency. This is a discussion of the history. Yeah. I won't repeat what yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but I just uh, the description. She was very big on the description of an action and getting it total. Yeah, I mean, it's it's it make in in some ways it's, it makes it more pressure, right? The whole because there's not an easy way out, right? It's like the Japanese surrender. There's not an easy way out. I mean, if the United States hadn't bombed Hiroshima. Um, they could have done, um, they could have continued a naval blockade, but I think Hanscom thought that was very problematic as well. They could have done the land invasion. Um, you know, that would have been extremely bloody and we might not have done the peace terms that we wanted. But, you know, she says somewhere that uh, in, in War and Murder, at some point though, at least if we are, um, she's writing War and Murder for, for Catholics in particular in the government. And, she says we have to trust in divine providence as well. She imagines people who were ready to um, nuke the Soviet Union, right? To um, when they go up to heaven and stand before God, saying, "You know, we uh, had to break your commandments because we did not believe your promises." And you know, Anscombe, you know, so that's a pretty it, strong it, faith. Yeah, it intersects with philosophy, but there's a religious dimension here as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, um, yeah, I have two questions about um, generally, I think, Oscar's view on contention and its relation to it here. So, my first question is um, when we are talking about morality, or in this case, murder, do you think she has a specific level of abstraction in mind that we should be thinking about it? And you say it was like the back, the group class paper in the background echoing. Um, so, if, you know, certainly if you, you could describe them in things in different ways. Uh, and ask them, to ask them if that's seem to matter that some option is under a very specific description version from something else. So, I was wondering like, whether there is like a good standard that she thinks about. Or for her, it's just uh, whatever I do things it is what they are doing. And I think the second, I guess, briefer question in relation to that is, is this kind of conception of murder that relies heavily upon the mental state of the agent, uh, does this like come with the risk of not being able to identify what it was a murder? Um, and I, it's because, again, like for Hanscom, she seems to think that the agent has an observable knowledge of what they are doing in uh, other such and such description. But that kind of relies on, I think, one that the agent can lead to. Um, they are potentially hiding their intentions or like. Just acting better or saying that they did something else that they weren't. So, um, yeah, I wonder like, what you think about that. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, in intention, Anska talks about, you know, a case where um, she thinks oftentimes it's very obvious some connections are. 
she said she, she's sitting there writing her manuscript and she says, you know, anyone who's, who's a human being, right, who looks at this, who has this rational capacity to look at them through and tell you that it's going to be writing, it seems like that's writing. But there are other cases where it, where it might be to know someone's uh, exact intentions. And, you know, it, it frequently happens uh, in the law that a big part of the trial ends up um, determining whether the agent had the correct intention to satisfy the mens rea for the offense of issue. Um, and, you know, we, we go along with that. We can't, there are different kinds of evidence you can introduce. But many offenses include some kind of what's, what lawyers have called specific intention. Um, so, well, murder, right? Um, I think in, in, in current English laws, I understand that murder requires an intention to kill or at least cause a grievous law of violence. And a lot of murder cases that are included now are whether the agent had that intention or not. What, what's interesting is that um, Anselm thinks that actually, what, what that's actually what she would call the hard core of murder, really close to. Um, she thinks there are cases you can have for the tongue is not intentional, but it also is murder. She thinks that's what happened in the actual Smith case in the 1960s. Um, I don't believe Smith had an intention of killing the police officer that fell in love having tracked it. Um, but they really wanted to get him for murder because it created all kinds of problems in the law. Um, so she, I think she thinks the state can expand that. But, you know, other offenses too, for very involved with committing intention is entering someone's house. Uh, with the intention of committing a felony there, right? So, you know, whether someone's committing a burglary or just a simple break and enter, you're going to have to find about the agent's intentions. Um, stealing involves a certain kind of intention, right? Intention to um, take someone, something that belongs to someone else and retain it in your possession. So, it's, it's not just killing and murder that's going to involve these sort of issues. Going back to that, but um, yeah, Ron. Uh, yeah, this is Ron and Bay, um, retired library. Um, maybe you did cover this subject. Uh, I can't say that the acoustics are very good in this room. Um, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, you got trouble hearing my. And I, I hate to, I don't want to open a can of worms, but I, and maybe you covered this subject, but generally, uh, do we know what Amsterdam's feeling uh, was? About abortion. Oh yes, yeah. so was still about abortion. Oh yeah. Yes. So it was against it. Yeah. So basically, I'm reading the point four in the handout, and it seems to me that uh, well, here's a hypothetical. I'd say I'm a senior in high school, a uh, young woman. I've just been accepted to Penn with a full scholarship, and I suddenly find myself pregnant. And I say to myself, well, should I, should I have this baby uh, or should I go to pet? And let's make it even more sharp. Let's say Penn even offers to provide me with complete daycare for the child being an enlightened institution. Um, I assume that she would say that if, if she would decide that she can't have the baby because it would interfere with her educational experience, her lifestyle at Penn, that that would be um, an intentional killing of the innocent. Would that be right? Yes. Because a, a fetus is the most innocent of all creatures, right? It has no way of defending itself in the womb. Um, so it would be basically she would be murdering her own child in order to go to pen. I think that's exactly what I would say. Yeah. I, I just want to, you know, I'm trying to understand her position. I don't want to get into a big discussion on a very hot button issue. Uh, yeah, just to pinpoint what her position would be. Yeah, you know the only the only uh, small quibble we have there is um, she was really interested in the, in the question of the precise point where an individual human being comes to exist. Um, 
she, she didn't think that a zygote could be considered an individual human being um, for various reasons. I, I, don't, I don't want to go under an argument there or whether I think it's a good one or not. Um, but even in that case, she thought it was still human life of some sort and if not an individual human being. So, I mean, she was famously... Um, she would get caught up on that biology by now, though. So we wouldn't yeah, worry about that. Okay. But the other part that I mean, you'd have she to would, say, yeah. if if she were a student at Penn and in, in the culture of Penn right now, she may not be culpable because she may not understand that that's a living, developing, innocent human being within her. The yeah, culture yeah. may have blinded her, and so she would have lost the ability to make an informed consent out of it because of the culture. It is, it is interesting. She considers cases about um, ignorance um, and how that affects descriptions of actions in this paper, the two kinds of error and action. So there's there's an old question in moral theology about um, an executioner who believes, maybe even on good grounds, that the person he's going to be putting to death is innocent. Um, can he go through with it? And um, when this was debated in like the 18th, 19th century, there were there were scholars, there were theologians on each side of the debate. And she says that could be a case where um, the, the person could in good conscience um, go through with the killing and it wouldn't, it wouldn't constitute a murder precisely because the question was so difficult. Um, so she thinks, you know, when it comes to like mistakes of law or you know, legal, but also the moral law, the, the relevant standard is going to be very similar to mistakes of fact, which is, uh, is the agent in a position such that they, they could and should have known what the relevant standard is. Um, and it's going to, that's going to differ what you say in particular cases. You're not going to know the details. Would it even make a difference what she believed or knew? Let's say she had, had the position, well, this fetus is not a person until it's born, or I'm not really doing something bad. I'm actually promoting my own education. I might become a famous brain surgeon someday and save millions, thousands of lives. For Anscombe, does the intention and the knowledge of the perpetrator make any difference? Well, well certainly the intention does because, right, the hardcore of murder is intentional killing. So the intention matters. The knowledge is going to matter to the extent that culpability is built into the concept of murder. What's really interesting is like she, since culpability is built in, as I said in the talk, she's not going to think there's any such thing as material murder in the way that it can be material adultery. But she does talk in her articles in war about killings that are objectively, and I think there she means materially unjust, right? Because you can have soldiers who are fighting in a war that is in fact unjust, but they've been subject to extreme government propaganda. They've been subject to extreme duress, right? They'll shoot you or kill your family if you don't serve. Where they might really be in a state of what would be called invincible ignorance about the justice of the war, or the duress might mitigate or even remove some of their responsibility. And in those cases, those soldiers, even fighting an unjust war, they might not be, um, even if they can kill people, if they, if they really believe it's just, and they have good grounds for it, they might not be committing murder, although she would say they are committing materially unjust acts, and so they can be resisted by the just side using force. Well, we seem to have a different the last of the executioner, yeah. and that um, confuses me. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't want to get into it because you know, I don't want to type this and put the uh, question next, but it seems like this responsibility level number four, um, playing a large role, when, when I mean bracketed, you know, part of the discussion about um, he was acting as a legitimate <laughs> in case where you say that someone could believe that it might be only an innocent person. But it was definitely bad to do that in the case of execution and not to be guilty of murder. No. Well, I mean, even legitimate authority, right? She, um, there cannot, she thinks there cannot be such a thing as a legitimate title to kill innocent human beings because that's the hard part of murder. So, um, the execution case is still a hard case, right? Yeah. If, 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 if and you know, execution raises all kinds of issues about capital punishment too, which, right, that's a whole can of worms in itself. Um, I don't think anyone's going to believe that 
capital punishment is, is in every society always justified. Um, yeah, no, but, there, but there can be a, there can be like a, a title still. She thinks that um, police can exercise that title in really extreme circumstances uh, where they're fighting members of a, of a mafia that become so powerful that almost it's almost like a non-international armed conflict. Um, in war, you could have that. Like capital punishment, at least theoretically, could have that. But none of those titles would give them the title to kill an innocent human being. Okay, so maybe perhaps I misunderstood her conclusion. That we we talked about that. Mm -hmm. Basically, yeah, I'm Jason. I'm a junior in Penn, and I wanted to avoid this discussion of culpability or very relevant to me. Yeah, uh, I'm curious about Ascom's understanding, like the essential definition of what exonerating and serious labor would be able to fight the damage. Yeah, what's the essential definition for it? Because I'm receiving a little bit of a question begging aspect to. Uh, the example she's giving here, because she's kind of saying, like, it's an, a given act of murder because it meets all these criteria, except when it's not, and it's not. So I'm, I'm trying to understand what is the exonerated cancer to occur, and why is it that, why is it that if a given action meets the, the criteria for emergency games, I guess it can but four or five days rather than accountability. So it meets the criteria. Nevertheless, it's not murder if it meets these one in five and six. Yeah. Yeah. I don't. I don't know. Like any one place where she puts that all together. And in a way, in the slaughter paper. This is a, a part of. It. I'm trying to figure that out. I'm trying to give some larger theory. I mean, some of the. I mean, right. The first kind of answer just showed that there wasn't a voluntary action took place at all. Right. That's and another time will show that it was voluntary, but the agent uh, there was invincible ignorance. Right. So lawyers are distinguishing justifications and excuses. And what's really interesting about her exonerating the answer is that it kind of encompasses both those under like one umbrella. Um, the, the the duty the the uh, killing by omission that you mentioned in the fifth one. For her, that turns on something about causation and about how we attribute someone being the cause of the death in the first place. So that's that's something quite distinct from the other excuse or justification. Well, well why can't the example you're giving? Why can't they be subsumed either into the, the causation inquiry, the first element, or into the accountability of the second one? It seems like she's reading the exonerating answer as a third element, but they kind of sound very similar to the first two, the example. Yeah, um, I, you know, I don't know why she wants them all together as exonerating answers. Yeah. Um, I have a question about the process of your research rather than the content sure. of that Enscom stuff. Do you, you've, been, you've been going through the archives. Do you think you have now examined all of Enscom's papers that relate to this topic, or do you have more to explore? I, I know I've, uh, uh, I've read all the published things, the things that have been published so far. Now, as far as the archive is concerned, this paper was based off of research I did at the Anselm Archive over the course of four days last year. You know, there's like over 600 items there. And the way they're categorized, some of them have titles. Some of them, they just give you the first sentence. Um, as a finite being, I was not able to look at all 600. <laughs> what I could do was look at all the titles and look at those first lines and anything that seemed like it was drawing on these topics based on those titles and descriptions. I, I was able to look through. So um, you, you may yet come across some nuances that will add some it's, to your insight. That's really, that's really possible. I'm hoping to get back in there tomorrow. But, you know, some of the notebooks she's writing about, um, they'll be on free will, or they'll be on something on Wittgenstein's philosophy, on Tractatus. I don't, I can't say, I, I know that there's like maybe some paragraph in there where she's writing in the margin and maybe it came up sort of um, just kind of came up in the course that it had to do with irrelevant topics. Well, that'll keep me up at night wondering yeah. if there is another paragraph. Yeah. Yeah. What, what really struck me about doing research at the archive was how well it fit 
with the published stuff. I, how about that? I mean, none of the stuff that I thought the archive was dated, so I don't know when it came from. I'm speculating it was probably during those, some of this is probably her lecture notes when she was lecturing in Cambridge in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of overlap between, you know, her best, I think her best developed paper, she kind of put all her ideas down was murder and memorality in modern Asia. Um, and that action intention and double effect paper. Those two, they were like early 1980s when they were published. So that research was probably like culminating from what that, that project she had in the 70s, um, which she initially got into because of this debate happened in the 50s and 60s with the uh, modern, the British moral philosophers. Um, I, I can't, I couldn't find anything where it seemed to me obvious that this contradicted something in the published writings. It seemed to me what it would do is like, you know, gave you that paragraph about the five times of exonerating response that's in modern, or that's in murder and morality in Asia. You'd have essays kind of going on those themes, but developing in more detail, like those three labels, and then more examples for those three kinds of levels of responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. So it's, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting. Oh, um, I was wondering if you could say more about what constitutes a state of innocence in the killing of innocent people. If it's just somebody who's not committing no, no kentis no, or in a state yeah. of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is there is there a degree of wrongdoing that does she ever does she ever talk about what degree of wrongdoing um, nullifies somebody's in, innocence or anything like that? Yeah. That, no. That's a really great question. You know, you could say in a way that like all maybe the biggest topic in modern analytical just war theory, I think all the stuff coming out by Jeff McMahon and people responding to him is precisely on this question. Uh, they, they approach it from the other and not from innocence, but the, the term is used as liable. What makes someone liable to um, attack and war? What makes someone liable to defensive killing? Um, the flip side, if you're not liable in that term, you're gonna be innocent. And there's all kinds of answers that are that are given. And you know, when she was writing in the 60s, she she addressed there's two places where I found where she addresses that, right? Mr. Truman's degree, there's like a sentence, and then war and murder is like another sentence or two. She thought that was a relatively straightforward thing. And I think this contemporary just wish stuff shows it's not straightforward. A lot of it is going to involve like these kind of collective ABC questions, how people can get to be um, liable because of some collective action they're engaged in. Um, but yeah, does that, does that at least help? Yes. I mean, that's yeah. sort of saying that there, yeah. she doesn't really give mm -hmm. a, a, a good account. It's a lot more problematic than I think she thought it was. Yeah, it's interesting to know she thought it was so straightforward. Yeah. Thank you. So to get kind of more subtle question back to uh, Tom's practical question, yeah. um, you, you mentioned that she had a couple lines in this question. Yeah. Two published places. Have um, we, we just released, or we believe we just released this database of her published work where you can get keyword mm -hmm. searches? I knew it was coming, but I haven't I haven't seen that. I didn't know it was actually released. Okay, yeah. So um so that might be uh something to see there are a few other great things. Yeah, really yeah. And that's um the project was just completed. And the next stage then is to think about there's a much one bigger project. But how to do that with the archive? Yeah. Right? So that we could have a keyword search that in the same way. But there's been a lot of good, very important preparatory work done by uh, students like Ayana and others in the direction of her friends of to a better catalog and digitize it. So it's in the works. The website for the, the database that is up, if anyone's interested, is anscombsearch.collegiuminstitute.org. Okay, I'll definitely be playing around with that. <laughs> <laughs> that happens. Next fellowship. <laughs> Next fellowship. Next fellowship. Yeah, that is exactly. Very good. Um, there are not any other immediate questions. Um, I know that um, Mr. Shuck has, has yet to eat lunch, right? And so, uh, for those who want to stick around and uh, 
Right. And it's companionship. Well, who does that? My name is also an answer to your question. I'm really happy to. Um, but I also just want to, I mean, before we really thank Professor Stockler and let uh, folks know what is coming up next in this particular area of um, uh, the property of Amazon. And so next month, um, we have on April 14th. Friday, April 14th, an exhibition um, of material from the Anstone market specifically related to Anstone's relationship with her mentor, Mother Wickenstein. It's called Ranching Faith and Philosophical Revolution. And that will be at 9.30 in the morning on uh, Friday, April 14th at the Design Center for Special Collections. Um, and that is meant to be a prelude to a mini conference. So I gave that afternoon in the philosophy department. Um, that's, those things are happening in person. Did uh, the uh, week prior, 10 days prior, um, the next session of our monthly ESCO reading group on uh, contention and ethics. Will take place, I think, on April 5th. Is, is that right? I mean, uh, something April like 4th. That. April 4th. April 4th. Okay, yes. So it's back in the day there, April 4th. Um, and so, whether you're joining us, um, whether you're here in person, whether you're joining us online, that's a special thing. I'm um, invited to meet us for you. Um, and if there's anything to contact us, it is. Um, with that, uh, thank you to Mr. Stuckel for giving us this paper, which is the fruit of research in the archives, especially that it's interesting to us. Um, and also because of the magnitude of the issues it addresses, and what um, in terms of issues to address and in moral philosophy related to the action of the murder is very important to get right. And so well, thank you for um, introducing. And some thoughts on the subject, and we look forward to the rest of the project. It's time to synthesize the various So please join me in thanking Professor Stubborn.